Hey everyone, welcome to Evangel Church Online, a safe place for you to explore faith in Jesus. And in today's video, we want to take a, just a moment to acknowledge and to pray into and ask God to intervene in what's going on in Eastern Europe and Ukraine with Russia. But also, we're going to be continuing our series in the Gospel of John and asking the question, what do vines and grapes have to do with spiritual practice and spiritual realities? Hey guys, my name is Lucas. I'm one of the pastors here at Evangel Church in beautiful Powell River, British Columbia. And this is released every, every nine o'clock every Sunday. And about an hour from now, we're going to be having our in-person gathering. And at that gathering, we are going to be acknowledging and praying into the situation happening in Ukraine. And um, we believe that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that God places leaders and leadership but he also removes them he also walks out the processes within the kingdoms of men he is the king of kings and so we want to invite you into that kind of corporate time of prayer and so we're just going to take a minute at the top of this uh time together just to pray in and acknowledge what's happening it's it's um you know when we see injustice in the world we're called to step in as believers as christians and so lo we just come to you. And Lord, we pray for those that um, have, those that have authority, those that have influence, those that have the ability to make change. And Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would visit them, that you would give them understanding and wisdom, that Lord God, you would uh, convict and convince and, and you would do what only you can do in the heart's of men and women in this time and in this day. Lord, we pray for those that do have authority around the world, Lord, that you would give uh, wisdom and understanding, that, Lord, you would uh, give uh, a strategy and ability to walk this out in a way that doesn't come to full-scale war, but rather, Lord, uh, a way that would cause us to be able to step through this situation. And Lord, that you would just, you would come and Lord, we just declare peace over this whole situation. Lord, we don't know what to do. It, 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 it seems so out of our control. But Lord, we know that you are in control, that you are sovereign, that you are um, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so Lord, we pray that you would intervene in, in the affairs of these countries in, in Eastern Europe here, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for protection over the innocents, over those fleeing, the citizens that are... Um, fleeing the, the children and, and Lord, we just pray that you'd be with each individual. Lord, we know that you know them by name. So Lord, would you be with each one? Would Lord, you make a way. Would you, the, the neighboring countries that are taking in refugees and those fleeing this war, Lord, would you be with them? Would you give them wisdom? Would you give them a large capacity to just love these people and to offer them sanctuary and protection? And so, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would go before each individual through this time and through this season. And that, Lord, you, by your sovereign grace, you would lead us to a conclusion in Jesus' name. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for just taking a moment to pray. And I know uh, many of you, your eyes are glued to the television, glued to whatever medium you have, uh, bringing stories out of Ukraine and Russia and um, you know, we also want to think of the Russians. You know, there are many there that are against this. They're, they're not for this, but their voices feel muted and, and not heard. And so we, we don't want to lump everyone into the same kind of uh, ideology and the same kind of pursuits. And so we think of all those that um, are walking in the injustice of this moment on the world stage. So let's continue to pray. Let's continue to lift them up. Well, we're going to jump into our time together in the Word of God. We are in the Gospel of John series, and we are now in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We are, we are kind of cruising through, and so we are excited to kind of continue this series. Um, as I'm recording this, it's sunny outside. It's beautiful. Uh, it's a little chilly, but the sun is shining. There's no rain. It feels, it feels a little bit like spring. And that's kind of exciting. There's something exciting about the turning of the seasons. And, and I must say, uh, the, the, 
The idea of new growth, the things that were once dormant through the winter now springing up from the ground and then all of those things, those are exciting. That new life, that season of a new life. But here's the deal. With that said, I am dreading a little bit the idea of having to go back to doing yard work. Now I know some of you, you love it. You love weeding and pruning and mowing the lawn and, and it's therapeutic for you. And I'm so glad, God bless you. I'm so glad that you would love it. I hate it. It's an inconvenience. I don't enjoy it at all. But the part that I don't enjoy the probably the most is the seasonal pruning that needs to happen. Now, my yard, I have a couple cherry trees. I got a plum tree. I have a grapevine. I got a kiwi vine. Um, and just, oh, you have to know so much. If you feel like you got to become like kind of a, you get a degree in horticulture to really know what to do and how to do it. Um, I don't, I'm not very thoughtful. So what I do is I, I kind of prune, um, <laughs> I kind of prune things, um, you know, with the precision of uh, trimming rose bushes with the chainsaw. Like I, I just hack everything back in the fall and I hack it in the spring and then I hope that stuff happens. But, but here's what's funny. Every year, despite myself and despite, you know, how brutal I am at pruning, we have fruit. We have more and more fruit. And it's this interesting concept that when you prune, you bear more fruit somehow. I don't fully understand it. Uh, something about nutrients getting to different things and not going to dead branches and useless branches and, um, and all of this stuff. But, but did you know that in scripture, Jesus uses this metaphor and he basically says, God, the father is a horticulturalist. Uh, <laughs> He calls him the vine dresser. We're going to kind of jump into this moment in the gospel of John, but, but God, he prunes the lives of people. He prunes within seasons in the life of the church. And the results of his pruning is rich and abundant fruit. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 15, John chapter 15. We're going to start right at verse one. Uh, for those who are new with us, we are in this gospel of John series. And if you need a Bible, would you visit myevangel.church forward slash Bible and you can get a Bible on your phone right now or whatever device you're on and you can kind of track with us. So we have a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, this is, we have a big passage. We're going to be going to verse 17. So just bear with us. We're going to be kind of walking through this rather quickly, but let's uh, take a moment to pray. Lord, would you lead and guide us in truth? Lord, last week we discovered that you are the helper. You are the teacher you lead and guide us you give us understanding and so lord in this moment as we open your scripture as we look at the teachings of jesus holy spirit cause these truths to come alive in us in jesus name amen all right chapter 15 verse 1 john i am the true vine and my father is a vine dresser every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit a couple of things you need to understand as we dig into this moment and this dialogue of jesus is the vine before this moment the vine was a metaphor in the old testament for israel israel was the vine and the purpose of Israel as a nation was to make God known to the nations of the world. The, the, the purpose and, the, and the, the, the calling of Israel to be distinct, to follow the law of God, to walk out a peculiar way in this world, had all of its motivation and calling and purpose to this idea of revealing God, Yahweh, the one true God, to the world. And so they were the vine. In fact, this moment could very well have um, happened at the doors of the uh, temple. Uh, Jesus and the, right, the last time we saw that they rose and they left where they were having that moment of dinner together. Now they're on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it could very well be that as Jesus makes this statement, he's outside of the temple gates. Now, why, why does this matter? Why is this important? Well, uh, C.G. Cruz, he says this, In the time of Jesus, 
A great golden vine hung over the entrance to the Jerusalem temple. Josephus, who is a first century historian, describes it. The gate opening into the building was, as I said, completely overlaid with gold, as was the whole wall around it. It had moreover above it these golden vines from which depended grape clusters as tall as a man. So this is a really neat kind of scene. And there's this sort of potential that as Jesus kind of draws this conclusion and brings this teaching, that this is the backdrop, this great golden vine that once uh, represented Israel, you know, God, Israel, God's people revealing God to the world. Now Jesus steps into this moment and he says the seventh I am statement. If you've been tracking with us, you know that he's gone through all of these I am statements, revealing himself as the Messiah, revealing himself as God to the world. Uh, in John 6, 35, he says, I am the bread of life. In John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. In, in John 10, 7 to 9, I am the door of the sheep. I am the gate to the sheep. Uh, John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 10, 11 and 14, I am the good shepherd. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. And now we come to this moment and he says, and he states, I am the true vine. Now, now why, why does he kind of say, I am the true vine? Because it's sort of in this declaration he declares that Israel was, was a stand-in as a vine, as a representation of God to the world, was simply a stand-in until this moment right here. When Jesus arrives on this planet, God incarnate, God with skin on, revealing God the Father to the world. And in that purpose, in that him living that out in this world. He says, I am the true vine. I am the very thing that Israel was supposed to represent. And I am now here, the true vine. It's in this declaration that he declares himself to be the vine, the one bringing the revelation of God to the world. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You know, he goes on, he, he declares that the Father, the Father God is the vine dresser. Uh, he's the horticulturalist. He, he's the one who prunes and tends and takes care of the vine. Who removes the branches that don't bear fruit. But he also trims and prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will bear more fruit. And this becomes kind of an interesting concept. Um, <clears throat> and this is a concept that for many years really bothered me because, you know, sometimes when we think of God pruning things from our lives, not uh, pruning things like on an individual basis, you know, you think of your life and God pruning things, much of life, much of kind of the first moments of being a believer in Jesus is the spirit comes and he prunes away kind of sin and brokenness and broken places and, and uh, things in our lives that are of the world. And, and everything is like kind of dead branches, right? He, he prunes away the dead branches so that we can walk in repentance, we can walk in forgiveness, and we can walk into a new way. Right, And so there's this kind of idea of pruning and that's, that's painful, yes, because it means dying to ourselves and, and, and allowing the spirit to cause these passions and these purposes of pursuit in other things, other priorities to take place. And it's painful, but we understand it. Like we can understand why he's pruning away broken things of this world because we've read scripture, we've been convicted of sin, and, and we can, we can kind of handle that process in terms of um, why it's happening. But here's where things get tricky. Because not only does he prune away the dead branches of our life, 
But then oftentimes what will happen is he'll begin to prune away branches that are bearing fruit for the kingdom in our lives. And this becomes a much trickier thing to really grasp, a tension that we have to kind of walk through. You know, it's a, it's a painful day when God the Father prunes that branch from our lives that's bearing fruit. And, but it's, it's such an important moment because it's in that moment that we have to trust him, that he knows a better way. Um, I lived, when I left Winnipeg, I, I left at um, 18, uh, moved down to Dallas, Texas. And so I went to Bible college there and I loved it. Just, I, I loved the people. I made like meaningful friendships. I was pursuing God. I was growing in, in God and my knowledge of God and um it was kind of the kind of environment. It was a campus of about 1,600 students. I lived on campus, so I lived in the dorms. And so just, just it was so much fun. I so enjoyed the kind of this moment, this time of growing in, in my sense of my purpose and calling and having these friendships of like-minded people that are pursuing Jesus and we're worshiping together. And just, just everything about it was just so life-giving to me. And I'll never forget the moment when I really began to sense that God was calling me away from that season to that place. And I really grieved it because God was calling me to prune away something in my life that was bearing fruit. I didn't understand at the time. And so at that time, I then transferred to a a kind of uh, affiliated college in Surrey, BC. And um, the, I won't say the college, but it, it, it was not my favorite time at all. Uh, it was a small college. I think they had like at that time, like 68 people in the entire college. Um, we, there were no dorms per se. We had to live and I had to commute and just the, the, the whole dynamic kind of really, really shifted. And though I had some good friendships there, I did not enjoy that season the same way. But, but here's the thing. Though I was struggling to wonder, you know, Lord, why did you prune away that life-giving, amazing time? I, I had to kind of, in that moment and in that season, really trust that he knew what he was doing. And it turns out he did because it was at that college that I met Lisa, my wife. It, it was at that college where the opportunity to step into my first full-time vocational ministry expression happened. It, it, it was out of that moment of trusting that God knew what he was doing, though he cut out some fruit-bearing things in my life, and though I grieved the loss of that, he led me into something so much better, something that set me up for the rest of my life. And, and so we, we, when God prunes, it's not to limit fruit. It's never to limit the fruit of your life and your ministry. When God prunes in your life, even when he prunes good things, ministry, expressions that are bearing fruit, when he prunes those things, he makes room for even greater fruit. He, he makes room for an increase in your capacity, but pruning, it can be painful. And, and perhaps you're kind of listening and God is calling you to prune some things out of your life, prune some, some things out of your ministry, prune some things out of what you're doing. And, and you're grieving that and you're maybe pushing against that because Lord, but, but, but. Friend, when God prunes, he prunes in order to make room for an increase. He prunes the branch here so the branch here can bear even greater yield in fruit. If, if God is asking you to lay something down, I, I believe that he has something greater for you to pick up once your hands are empty. Now, I say that, but I, I want to warn you. <laughs> pick something up. Um, God doesn't lead us to these idle, idle moments. He always calls us to pick something up, to have purpose in our hands, to, to have purpose in our feet, in our going. Um, so when you lay something down, don't lay down and, and, and do nothing. 
Begin to ask God, Lord, what am I to pick up now? What am I to walk in? What is the new expression of ministry and purpose for my life? Now, before we go on, we need to define what the metaphor of fruit means. You know, I'm using this metaphor. We're talking about fruit. What is that referring to? Well, if the vine is the vehicle and metaphor used for revealing God to the world, the main drive of what we mean by fruit is those being introduced to God through your life. So the main drive here, as we talk about missional uh, purpose and fruit, is disciples making disciples. Christians making Jesus' name famous through their lives. And when the opportunity presents, leading and guiding new believers into purpose and knowing God. That's the main drive of what we're talking about in terms of fruit. Um, but though that is the primary thrust of what we're talking about, it also speaks to this idea of the internal, the internal journey, the journey of God bringing fruit, the, the fruits of the spirit into our own lives, right? Cutting away some of the dead things, but, but causing uh, the fruit of the spirit to grow within us as individuals. Um, the theological word for this is sanctification, which essentially means looking more and more like Jesus each day. Um, C.G. Cruz says, the word translated to prune, kathero, can also mean to clean or to purify. So, so with that in mind, let's continue. Verse 3, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me. And I and you. You know, this becomes the key to being effective in the mission of disciples making disciples. Your capacity for bearing fruit in the kingdom of God is inextricably kind of linked to you abiding in the vine. Now, of course, who's the vine? Jesus has just declared, I am the true vine. Now, this means two things. Primarily, it, it speaks to being a follower of Jesus. Uh, being one who has kind of confessed him as God, who has repented of sin and given uh, your life to him. And so there's this idea of your standing in Christ, right? This idea of your standing, uh, being saved, being a son and daughter of God. It's like a standing, it's a title, it's a position that you hold because of Jesus. But, but it's, it's more than that. It also speaks to the dynamic of growing in your relationship and your intimacy with him. I love this statement that Jesus makes in verse 3. He says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Well, what does he mean by this? Well, earlier in, in John 8, 31 to 32, Jesus is recorded as saying this. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The, the word is more than just a concept of truth. The word is the person of truth. You know, at the very beginning of this journey together in the Gospel of John, we started at John chapter 1, verse 1, which says this, In the beginning was the word. This is speaking of Jesus. The Word. Jesus is the Word personified. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He, he conflates Jesus with the Word and the Word with Jesus. How, how do you abide in the vine? First step, give your life to Jesus Christ. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Confess him as God. Lord, I believe that you are God. You are the son of God. Confess your deep need for him. There's this idea of repentance. Lord, I am broken and I need a savior to do this work of creating new life in me. And in that moment, you begin this journey of abiding in the true vine, in Jesus you begin this idea of being positioned as a son and a daughter of God. But how do you grow in your practice of abiding in the vine? This, this idea of growing in intimacy and relationship. 
I would say the first thing that we see here is be in the word of God. If Jesus is the word and the word is Jesus, as we open the scriptures, this is truth, not just truth in terms of ideas. This is truth personified in Jesus. And so we open the scriptures and in those scriptures, we begin to understand the character and the nature of God. And as a result, we begin to understand who we are because we are created in the image of God. It's in the washing and the revealing of the word that you learn in greater measure the love, the character, and the personhood of God. It's in the word that you learn the way that leads to life and peace and joy. Abiding in the vine means being in the word of God. But, but it also speaks to the power of prayer. The, the intimacy that grows as we speak to and hear from this God that we are now a part of in terms of sons and daughters. is this God who is now our Father through Christ Jesus. To, to pray without ceasing is to understand that our standing before God gives us access relationally to God. Right? This standing in Christ, we are now sons and daughters who have access to the very presence of God. To have intimacy and a deepening of relationship with God as we pray and speak and share our lives with him. We get to invite him into our circumstances, into our day, both the struggles and the celebrations. But, but it's also in this moment that Jesus gives us two statements that we need to kind of lean into. In verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? You can do nothing. Your ability to bear fruit is inextricably linked to your remaining in the vine. The, a branch no longer connected to the vine isn't going to bear fruit. What's it going to do? It's, it's going to begin to die and dry out and shrivel up and decompose. If it's not connected to the vine, why, why is that? There's this deep and humbling reality that, is, that, that we kind of need to wrestle with here. Your, your ability to be effective in making disciples, in walking in the purposes and the plans of God for your life, your ability to walk that out in growing in character and integrity, of walking into the fruit of the Spirit, is dependent on you being a part of the vine. Now, now why is that? Well, if you think of a vine, the vine is the thing that is rooted. The vine itself, not the branches, the vine itself is what is rooted. The vine has access to the power of life, right? To the nutrients of the soil, to the, the moisture of the ground. So what, what did Jesus just declare? He says, I am the true vine. In other words, I am the source of life. I am the source of sustenance. I am the source of provision. I am the source of peace. I am the source of of purpose. And so the vine becomes so important that we are part of the vine. He is the vine. We are the branches. And we can't in any way begin to see ourselves as the source of anything good in terms of the purposes and the plans of God for our lives. Without him, we can do nothing. And this is a humbling place to be. This is a humbling idea. Because we don't want to think of ourselves as dependent on anyone, especially in our culture. Because independence is such a, um, almost like a virtue that we've created. But the Christian way, the biblical worldview calls us to depend on the vine for our source of life and, and power and grace and strength to bear fruit in this world. Um, I, uh, I, I rarely do house chores without having some earbuds or some headphones on. Uh, usually I'm listening to an audiobook or a podcast, you know, kill two birds with one stone. Uh, household chores are too boring, so I need to have a little extra going on. But sometimes I find myself like pushing a vacuum or uh, pushing the steam mop 
And because I have my headphones on, I can't really hear what's going on. I got something going on in my ears. Uh, every once in a while, I'll pull something far enough with the cord that it'll pop out of the wall. And, and I'll find myself for a little bit pushing a vacuum that's not on or a steam mop that's disconnected from the power. And here's what's funny about that, because pushing that vacuum, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty useless in terms of an exercise, right? Um, you know, in fact, the work, the work, the output from me remains the same, right? All of a sudden, I don't realize it. That vacuum is now disconnected from power, disconnected from the wall, and I'm pushing this vacuum. My input, my work, my output is the same. I'm still pushing this thing. I'm still covering ground, but it's not doing anything. There's no power. I'm disconnected from the source. And sometimes, you know what? Like we can be caught up in seasons of life and ministry where we're working hard. You know, we're doing all the right things. We're going through the motions. But because we're disconnected from the vine, because we're not abiding, spending that time relationally in the word of God, in prayer, in the spiritual disciplines, in the spiritual practices of life, we are working hard, but the outcome the fruit that we expect might not be there because we are doing it in our own power. And when we are disconnected to the vine, doing it in our own power, what does it say? We can do nothing. The producing of meaningful fruit is, is diminished when we're not abiding in the vine. But, but it can even get worse than that. In verse 6, Jesus goes on. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. William Barclay, he writes this. So, so then there are three ways in which we can be useless branches. We can refuse to listen to Jesus Christ at all. That makes us a useless branch. Uh, we can listen to him and then render him a lip service unsupported by any deeds. A useless branch. We, we can accept him as master and then in the face of difficulties of the way or the desire to do as we like, abandon him. Useless branch. One thing we must remember, it is a first principle of the New Testament that uselessness invites disaster. The fruitless branch is on the way to destruction. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. This is a hard saying. There, there's no way of kind of getting around this. Your salvation, your identity, your freedom and liberty, they're all rooted in being part of the vine, Christ Jesus. Life is in Jesus, and apart from him, there is only death. And this is the teaching of the Christian faith. It's a hard teaching in this climate of our society it's not a popular teaching because of its exclusive nature. But Jesus is. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And it's not just a good idea among many good ideas in this world. No, no. This is the idea. This is the reality. This is simply the statement of truth for every human being. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And you either find life and fruit being in the vine or you find death and decay and destruction not. And this is a hard teaching. This is a hard saying. But here's the beauty and here's the good news. The invitation to be a part of the vine, to be positioned as sons and daughters of God, to, to have a renewed relationship with the creator of the world. That invitation is for everyone. But it's through Christ Jesus. It's through the true vine. Jesus Christ. Jesus goes on in verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 
These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. What what a set of promises here. Over the past few weeks, we've unpacked some of the dynamics spoken here. We're talking about prayer. Now we talk about walking in, you know, the ways and the will, uh, submitting ourselves to the kingdom of God in terms of priority around our prayers. Now uh, we, we've, we've talked about this idea of love uh, for one another, but I really want to kind of dig into this concept of joy here, this promise of joy. Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now the word joy, chara here, Closely, it means closely related to gladness and happiness, although joy is more a state of being than an emotion. It's a state of being, a result of choice, one of the fruits of the Spirit. Having joy is part of the experience of being a Christian. You know, joy is this, is this state of being that resides outside and apart from circumstances, seasons of life, uh, good times, bad times. Joy is a position and a state of mind that exists beyond those things. Joy is the fruit that grows as we abide in Jesus. In some ways, joy is this miraculous manifestation in our lives by the Spirit. It's a grace. It's a strength in our weakness. It's It's a state of mind, but it's a state of mind that's empowered to us and is given to us as this gift from the Spirit. It's supernatural. It's miraculous. It's a part of being in the vine and just being in proximity to Jesus. But it's also a result and a byproduct of submitting our lives to the ways of Jesus. And it's in that that we find this fullness of joy, this state of mind, the state of being in terms of happiness and gladness in our hearts. I don't know about you, but this passage has been so timely, kind of considering the current state of affairs in our world today. You know, I I really believe in this moment, this time, with everything going on, we need to lean into Jesus. And and when everything else seems like it's kind of crumbling around, we we can lean into this connection with the true vine, which gives us this state of being, This state of gladness and happiness and thankfulness because of the joy that he extends to us. Again, this brings us back to a recurring theme over the last little while. And and we need to have kind of this eternal perspective. I I believe that joy is found in eternal perspective. The, The more we get our eyes on this world and the ways and the things of this world, the more disconnected we become from this concept of joy, fulfillment, Um, uh, being satisfied, contentment, all of these kind of things that really kind of play into this idea of fullness of joy. The more we get our eyes on this world, the more we fix our gaze here, the less we experience this state of being and joy. But the more we have an eternal perspective and we see the things of this world in light of an eternal reality, we come back to this state of being, joy. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Did you know that God chose you? If you're you're someone in Christ Jesus, God chose you. Uh, You didn't choose him. Uh, He chose you first. In fact, the faith that you had to believe in Jesus was a gift that he gave you by the Spirit. The grace, like when you really comprehend coming to Jesus, just the pure grace and mercy that he extends to us to know Jesus, to even take that step of confession is from him. And so he chose you. You know, that invitation to be grafted into the vine was his to give you. 
But, but even more than that, the creator of all things, the, the one who was there at the beginning of creation, who called into being everything that you know, he calls you friend. And that's such a humbling concept. The creator of all things, the eternal one, the one who created time and space, he calls you his friend because he was made, he's made known to you his plans and his purposes, not just for your life, but for the lives of those around you and for this world. He calls us into this endeavor, into this purpose, into this grand plan of bringing creation back to the creator, to, to restoring to original intention what he created and he made. I can't think of a more meaningful purpose or a humbling reality than that. I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again and I'll keep on saying it. If, if you have to choose between great purpose and your passion, choose purpose every time. Choose purpose every time. You know, sometimes your passions, you have these seasons and moments where your passions come into alignment with that purpose. And those are great. Enjoy those seasons. But there's, there's no greater purpose than partnering with the creator of all things in leading this world back to God through Jesus Christ. Right? A great and grand purpose will keep you motivated beyond your passions. Our time today ends with this statement. Verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. You might ask, why, why does this love for one another seem so important to Jesus? He keeps coming back to this. It's kind of like the nail that he keeps on beating the head of it. Um, love one another. Have love for one be, be one with one another. Like He calls us back to this idea. And I, and I really believe it's in loving one another in Christ that we authenticate the claims of the gospel. It's, it's this idea that diversity can come together and walk in unity and love. That all tribes and tongues and nations can come together under the banner of a better kingdom. The kingdom of God and a greater purpose. And we, we get to authenticate the claims of the Christian faith. That, that, that it's, it's both a, an awesome responsibility, but it's a humbling invitation. That we get to authenticate through the way that we love one another. Through the way that we are united with one another where we forgive one another, where we acknowledge our shortcomings with one another, where we confess our sins to one another. And, and, and in all of that, we create safe places for, for each other in, in relationship, both with one another, but also with God. To be united and to be growing and to be maturing and to be abiding in the vine. But none of this happens unless each of us make the daily choice to abide in Jesus, to be in the word, to be in prayer, to be growing in our love and our intimacy with God. And when we come together out of, out of that kind of life, out of that kind of purpose, the fruit that we see within the corporate gathering of God's church uh, should be just absolutely abundant and beautiful. And we get to stand as a city on a hill, as a light in dark places, to show a better way. So Lord, we pray that Lord, as you declare yourself the vine, the true vine, the one who represents and shows us the Father, that Lord, you call us into the state of being, yes, into being sons and daughters of the living God, this kind of state of salvation, the state of being redeemed, but Lord, also you call us into this practice, this daily practice of abiding relationally in intimacy with the creator of the universe. Lord, as we open our scriptures, Holy Spirit, would you lead and guide us in truth. As we pray in the day to day, Lord, may we hear your still small voice leading us and guiding us and perfecting our faith. And Lord, we pray that you would just have your way in each and every one of us. And when we come together, when we come together in this corporate way, in this, the thing, this thing we call the local church and the greater church worldwide, Lord, may we see a unity and a love for one another. Despite our differences, Lord, that we would put others first and esteem others greater than ourselves. That we would walk in the humility and the way of Jesus. 
in our interactions with everyone we come in contact with, revealing the Father, revealing love, revealing and authenticating that the gospel changes everything. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, thank you so much for taking this journey with us. Please continue in your prayer life. Continue to pray for this world. Continue to pray into the the things of this world. But don't, don't be distracted by them either. Because there is an eternal perspective. And there's a hope and a joy and a peace that's found in that. Even now, for you and for me. God bless. Have a great week, everyone. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Lucas, uh, for faithfully sharing God's word with us this morning. What a great uh, time we've had in the Gospel of John series. Well, I have uh, a kind of a family moment update and just a couple of other announcements for you guys to know. Uh, one of my responsibilities here at Evangel is that I am our missions liaison. And so um, my role is to kind of liaise between our missions committee and our staff and our missions committee and our congregation. And so uh, I have an exciting uh, and kind of like bittersweet update for you guys. So our missions committee uh, over the past couple of years has been in a, a season of discerning and a season of kind of rebuilding and recasting the vision uh, for what global mission and local mission could look like here in Evangel, but also around the world. So one of those points of discerning and evaluating is evaluating our global partner roster. And so as we're looking through our global partner roster and, and praying through that, we did sense a little bit of a shift. And so uh, our missions committee made a recommendation to our board, which was approved. And so I just want to let you guys know um, that we have concluded our financial partnership uh, with Dan and Mardell McTavish and uh, with some RAN workers that we were supporting. RAN means Restricted Access Nation, and so it is limited in who, uh, what we can share about who these people are. And so we have made the determination as the board has approved that we are going to conclude uh, our financial partnership with these two people. Um, but we are excited to say that we have also been in contact with new global partners uh, in a place in Philippines called Elo Elo City. And their names are Rod and Elna McDonald. And so we're so excited to let you guys know that although we are saying uh, a little bit of a goodbye to some partnerships that we've had in the past, that we are able to now bring on some new global partners, Rod and Elna McDonald. And we're so excited for that. We wanted to show you a quick video kind of of what their ministry would uh, does look like to give you guys an idea of who they are. Hi, I'm Rod and this is my wife, Elna. We are uh, global workers currently ministering in the Philippines. Our home base is in the heart of the country on the island of Panay. We've been ministering in Southeast Asia for 10 years. I'm involved in our modular Bible schools in India, Indonesia, Nepal, Singapore, and the Philippines. Alna has been leading short-term missions teams, doing small groups with university students and empowering leaders. Our vision is to make disciples, equip and empower leaders. We are blessed to have 11 universities and 6 colleges in our city. Through this, we have the opportunity to engage students who are future leaders. So we do this by preaching the gospel through small groups in schools and inviting them in youth events. So when the pandemic started, we switched to online platforms on a weekly basis to keep connected and encourage them through the Word of God. We love to equip the local church leaders through workshops and trainings. An example of this is our partnership with the local church and One Child, a sponsorship program that focuses on children in tribal and rural areas. We were given the opportunity in 2020 to provide materials for their child case workers in the mountains of Kanai. Now, these students have been faithful in attending classes and the national leadership of One Child has now granted permission for that Hope Center to be open and enrolled 170 children in school. So it's amazing what God did in the middle of a pandemic. We're excited as the new year begins. Uh, we're meeting with church leaders uh, to open a Bible school in the town of Sara, which is about two hours north of our city. Mm. Um, we're going to have 20 pastors and we're going to be reaching about 15 communities through those uh, leaders. 
Now, these pastors evangelists will reach out to the underserved communities, sharing the love and the hope that Jesus brings as we surrender our lives to Him. We also desire to equip the 10,000 Filipinos that go around the world as migrant workers and those who are Christians would see themselves as ambassadors of Christ. We want to encourage their faith communities here in the Philippines to pray and bless them as the work in these places shining the light of Jesus in dark places. We believe that reaching souls by the power of the good news of Jesus Christ will change nations. Will you join us today? Well, I don't know if you caught it in the video, but if you want a new friend or somebody in relationship, Rod and Elna McDonald are the people for you. They're the most friendly, uh, warm people that I know, and, and we're so excited to partner with them. And so if you guys are wanting to continue your own personal um, financial partnership with the McTavishes or our RAN workers, you are welcome to do that. Uh, if you go to the P Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada website, on their international missions page, it will have uh, both of those couples pages there and you're able to give and set up a partnership financially with them if you want to continue that relationship uh, on your own and kind of personally uh, if you determine that as well and so we're just so thankful uh, for uh, the season of discerning and for where God is leading us. Well, I have a couple of announcements for you. Uh, we are doing Grow Track at the end of uh, our service today. And so you guys uh, on our online stream are an hour earlier than our Sunday morning. And so if you wanna like quickly get ready and come to a Grow Track, we would love to invite you. This one's called Dream Team. Uh, it's how you can get involved in kind of the life of Evangel. And so uh, if you want to continue to discover your design and find your fit through Grow Track, we would love to have you here right after the service, about 11.45ish uh, here at the church for you to jump in. If you haven't been to 101, 201, or 301, that is okay. You can jump into Grow Track whenever you would like. Well, the next one is we are starting kind of a new module of Evangel Academy. And Evangel Academy uh, is a concentrated, kind of more formal discussion around God's word that we're journeying together. So we did a previous one uh, in how to study God's word. And this time we're gonna be talking about the life and teachings of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he's a dynamic man and, and wrote much of the, Old uh, the New Testament. And so we're so excited to jump into that. And we would love to see you there. It's gonna be March 6th, March 13th, 20th, and 27th here at the church at 6 30 p.m bring a notebook bring a pen bring your bible uh, and bring some great questions that you can that we can have discussion around together we would love to see you there as we jump into god's word uh, and grow deeper in the things of him well the next one is camp and we have uh, a great update so we are raising funds uh, to replace the basketball hoops and some dorm stairs at the new spay camp and i want to let you guys know that uh, as of this week we are have already raised 3500 dollars uh, towards kids uh, being able to experience camp in a way that's fun and safe and transformative so thank you so much for your partnership financially we still have some time to go uh, but we are blown away by your generosity and there are a lot of other ways that you can get involved in camp as well, uh, in serving. And so if you go to myevangel.church forward slash camp, it will give you all of the ways uh, that you can get involved with camp right now uh, or uh, this summer as well. And then finally, if you want to give to the everyday work that we do here at Evangel Church, we so appreciate your partnership with us. We can't do anything that we do without you and every penny helps. So if you go to myevangel.church forward slash give, it will again give you all the information on how to give. But friends, thank you so much for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your day.